scripture text this morning from Psalms 139 verses 1 through 5 and 2 Corinthians 4 verses 7 through 12. Hear the reading of the word of God once more. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Psalms 139 verses 1 through 5. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the depth of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we're always being given up to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. This morning I want to talk from the subject a piercing, powerful, proven faith. A piercing, powerful, proven faith. Let us pray. Father, I decrease that the Holy Spirit might increase. Speak through my vocal cords. Think through my mind. Father, your word is anointed. It shall not return to your void. It shall accomplish everything that you send it out to do. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. It is in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said amen, amen and amen. Us as you may be seated, thank you for your service at the door on this morning. Amen. A piercing, powerful, proven faith. Jay Leno recalls this story, this incident in his life. He says, as an immigrant, my mother lived in constant fear of deportation. You could miss up to four questions on the citizenship test, and mom missed five. The question she flunked on was, what is the Constitution of the United States? The answer she gave was, a boat, which wasn't entirely wrong. The USS Constitution was docked in the Boston Harbor, but the judge instantly denied her citizenship. Jay says, my father stormed up to the judge. What is this? Let me see the test. She's not wrong. The Constitution is a boat. The judge rolled his eyes and said, no, the Constitution is our basic governing 
And he wants to continue, but his dad interrupted, saying, it's also a boat in Boston. <laughs> the Constitution, the same thing. Come on, judge. The judge finally couldn't take it anymore, and he said, fine, she's a citizen. Now get out of here. So my father said to my mom, you passed. No, I didn't, she said. She was whimpering, crying. She says, they're going to come after me. From then on, any time my mother was even in the proximity of a policeman, she quaked with fear. When I took her to Scotland in 1983, she asked me, will I be able to get back in? Mom, don't worry. That was 50 years ago. But he says it never ended. His mother was always unsure of her citizenship status. When you think about that, Christians, even today, live with doubt as to their salvation and tremble when they hear the words of Jesus proclaimed in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Jesus said in his teaching, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Jesus says, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evil doers. Sometimes when you're in an airport, observe the difference between passengers who hold confirmed tickets and those who own standby. The ones with confirmed tickets read newspapers, chat with their friends, or fall asleep. The ones on standby hang around that ticket counter, pace and smoke. Smoke and pace. <laughs> the difference is caused by the confidence factor. Now, if you knew that in 15 minutes you would have to stand in judgment before the holy God and learn your eternal destiny, what would your reaction be? Would you smoke and pace? Pace and smoke while you're waiting on your turn? Would you say to yourself, I don't know what God's going to say. Will it be welcome home, child? Or will it be depart from me? I never knew you. So we must ask the question, how can we tell that our lives have truly been changed by our relationship with God and his Christ? Lord have mercy. A piercing, powerful yet proven faith. Well, the first sign of a changed life is an inner assurance. This assurance pierces the intellect and resides in the heart of a person. You see, salvation brings with it an inner assurance that we, in fact, belong to God. Romans 10, 14 declares... So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. So there can be no salvation apart from the word of God concerning the message of Jesus Christ. Now, there are a whole lot of good things in the world, and a lot of good approaches in life. I mean, if you're a Buddhist, Buddha can inform you, he just can't save you. If you're an Islamic, Muhammad can teach you a lot, but he can't save you. Confucius can guide you in a great way, and you can live a great moral life filled with peace, but Confucius can't save you. Salvation only comes from Jesus Christ. That was Christ's distinction Christ's mission, his sole purpose was to seek and to save them that are lost. Say amen, somebody. Amen. 
The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 through 6, for there is one God. There's only one God. And there are many, many gurus that talk and share about this God. But it also says there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for us all. This has been attested all throughout time that Jesus is the one you go to for salvation. Jesus is not the only, he has no corner on basic truth, no corner on basic wisdom. There are plenty of wisdom uh, in the world, even in the book of Proverbs, where Jesus was not speaking. Those wise sages gave us plenty of wisdom to live by, but none of them gave us salvation. Salvation only came through Jesus Christ, and Jesus is the only means for salvation. And that's important for us to know. We have to be assured that when we close our eyes, we will be uh, ushered into the presence of God and we will know without doubt that we are children of the Most High God, that God has forgiven our sins, that God has washed us and made us whole through the blood of Jesus Christ, that there's a common known story that comes from the life of Martin Luther. It is said that the devil approached Luther one day and tried to use the fact that every person is fallible. He presented the reformer with a long list of sins which he was guilty of. How many of you got a list? <laughs> yeah, I know I ain't the only one. Got a whole list of stuff that we know that we've done wrong. And he says uh, when he had finished reading Luther said to Satan, come on, think a little harder. You must have forgotten some of my sin. You can't have it all. Come on, think a little deeper. I want to make sure you got all the stuff I did wrong. And then he turned to Satan and simply said, that's fine. Now I want you to take that list, write across that list in red ink, if you got a red ink pen, write these words. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. There was nothing the devil could say to that. Isn't that good news? Yeah. That with all the imperfections we have, when Satan begins to try to accuse us and make us feel less than who we are, we can talk back to the devil and say, listen, devil, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. Mm. How many have that witness in their spirit? Believers know that salvation is an inside job. That God works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. That it is not an overnight process. That this thing is a lifetime of living, of rising, of falling. And that God already knows everything we've ever thought about doing. Every word, even your cuss words. God knew you were going to cuss before you cussed. That's the beauty of Psalm 139. Because that God knows us so intimately, then God sent his son Jesus into the world to deal with our sinfulness, with our weaknesses, so that we would not allow our weaknesses to determine our destiny. Hallelujah. Mm, that's deep right there. A lot of people spend time trying to disqualify themselves from their destiny. But God sent Jesus so we would have no excuse for fulfilling God's purpose for our lives. It's an inside job. That's why we as believers, we wrestle. We wrestle with, with enemies we can't see. But at the same time, we rejoice because we've got unseen resources working on our behalf. We live betwixt between. We got one foot in this world, one foot in the next. And we live in between with faith that everything's going to work itself out. Believers say, I will look to the hills 
from whence cometh my help, my help coming from the Lord. But you can't see anything in the hills. That is a statement of faith. You on the, you're in the valley, but you're looking toward the hill. That is a metaphor that says I've got a God that I can't see with my natural eye, but I've got faith to believe that God's got this. That's, that's powerful. That, that's piercing because it penetrates to the heart. It, 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 your intellect will talk you out of your salvation. But when you got that blessed assurance on the inside, you talk back to your mind and you let your mind know, I'm not depending on my emotions. I'm not depending on what I think. I'm not judge, jury, and executioner of my own life. God is sovereign over me. So you say, I'm going to leave it in the hands of the Lord. I can't beat it. I can't defeat it. But I can leave it in the hands of the Lord. I can't get around it. I can't get over it. I, I can't stop doing it. But I'm going to leave it under the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm going to walk on. I'm going to stand tall. I'm going to stand strong. I'm going to do what I'm called to do because I realize that failure is a part of living. But God's already taking care of my failures because he sent his son Jesus to pay the penalty for my failure. That's why we read Isaiah 53 all the time, you know. That he was wounded for my transgression, my wrongdoing. He was bruised for my iniquity. The stuff on the inside of me that I can't do anything with. The chastisement of my peace, my perfect relationship with God was placed upon his shoulders, the shoulders of Jesus. When he hung on the cross, all of my sin hung there with him and by his stripes we were healed. So what's your excuse? For not being all you can be. For not living past your flaws. For not stepping past your flaws, your flaws into your destiny. Why are you beating up yourself, downing yourself, crucifying yourself when Jesus has already paid the price? Hallelujah. So the first sign that you've really been changed, that you really, you really believe in what God said in his word, is that you don't allow sin to have dominion over you. You talk back to it. Y'all talk back to everything else. <laughs> yeah. Except your mama, because she slapped the taste out your mouth. <laughs> but you still talk back to everything else. You get folk told in a minute. You need to talk back to your shortcomings. Talk back to your sin. Let sin know, yeah, you're right, but you're not going to have dominion over me. I'm going to repent, and I'm going to keep on going. Mm. Amen. Our assurance, that inner assurance that we have comes from God's spirit. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. And so your faith in hearing and obeying the word of God is your assurance that you're a child of God. You have an inner assurance that no matter what you go through, you belong to God. Do you know that? That, that you're a child of God. You're in the family. See, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what happens to me. I'm going to be a griffin till I die. I can change my name, but I can't change my DNA. I'm going to be a griffin till I die. I'm going to have some of my daddy's stuff come up in me. Stuff I liked about daddy. Stuff I didn't like. Stuff I knew about my father. Stuff I never knew about my father. But I'm going to have some of that stuff come up because it's in my DNA. And so sometimes when children are, are separated from a parent, and they start going through things and they don't understand why they're having these experiences. And perhaps they can call their parent that's not there and ask, have you ever felt this way, ever gone through this? Or have you? And your parent is shocked you because the parent said, yeah, I used to deal with that. This is how I dealt with it. 
But now you see that in talking to a parent who knows you can move forward. Well, guess who knows you better than an earthly parent? God does. God knows and he knows how to help you deal with it. So you can't even say, well, you know, I grew up and my father wasn't there. That's not an excuse either. Because God knows everything about your father. God knows everything about your mother. God knows all there is to know to help you fulfill your destiny and to assure you that you are saved, that you've been adopted into his family, that you have unseen resources working on your behalf, and you can have that assurance no matter where you are right now. We used to say, well, here they come. Them Saturday night party clothes on. They ain't even been home yet. I can smell the smoke. I, I can smell the weed on them. They, they should at least went home and changed clothes. And they come to church because they know God was there when they were puffing. And they're not trying to impress you. They're trying to over, what is it, overcome some things. They're trying to press through some things. And they want an encounter with God so that God can do something for them. Which leads me to my second point. That the second sign that you've been changed and that you are saved is an inner power for obedient living. It is an inner power for obedient living. In other words, believers have been Filled with God's spirit. That same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead should exude power for living an obedient lifestyle in you. Thank you Lord. See, believers obey the word of God because they know it is the word of God because it resonates in their heart. Believers don't waste time doubting. They spend time doing how, how am I going to do it? I'm so afraid. I do it afraid. Hallelujah. Don't wait till you overcome your fear to move forward. Do it afraid. Because God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And so what if you make a mistake? God is right there with you. The psalmist said in Psalm 139, if I make my bed in hell, God is there. There's nowhere you can go outside of God's presence. And if God's got you, he's got you when you're right, and he's got you when you're wrong. You just have to learn to trust God. Mm, now I'm preaching, betting you shouting. Mike, Michael Green, Michael Green, Michael Green uh, gives this illustration to help us understand power, how powerful it is when you obey God. He says a little boy was riding his tricycle furiously around the block over and over again. Finally, a policeman stopped and asked him why he was going around and around. The boy said that he was running away from home. <laughs> then, then the policeman asked why he kept running around the block if you running away from home. Now listen to what the boy said. Because my mom said that I'm not allowed to cross the street. <laughs> The point is clear. Obedience will keep you close to those you love. Obedience will keep you out of trouble even when you're trying to get in trouble. Lord have mercy. That little boy is something else. He's running away from home. He ain't even crossed the street. All because his mother told him you're not allowed. You can go anywhere within these parameters you want to go, but don't cross the street. Isn't that just like God? God says you have free will. You can do whatever comes to your heart to do, but be careful about this road. Because this road leads to destruction. You don't need to walk on this road. Now, it's your choice, but I'm telling you ahead of time, if you cross the street over into that road, you're going to face some hardness in your life. You're going to learn obedience is better than sacrifice. You're going to learn you don't need every experience to have experience. Some people want to experience everything for themselves. But you don't need to experience everything to have an experience with God and in this life. Amen. My mom said I'm not allowed. 
to cross the street. There's just some things, you know, believers don't do because God said not to do it. It's trivial to some, silly to some, and ridiculous to others, but believers have learned to obey God. First, last, and always. And when they lapse in their obedience, they run toward God, not away from God. Yeah. Believers are not content to say, well, God knows my heart. Rather, believers want God to change their heart. So they go through this painful process of repentance that leads to real change. You'll recall earlier in the black church, we used to sing the song, Lord, fix my heart. And then we sang, fix me, Jesus, fix me, Jesus, like you said you would. Well, they knew they were broken. They knew they were shattered vessels. They knew that they needed a change. Even, I believe it was David, who penned these words, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. I just can't get it out of my mind. I'm walking around with a guilty conscience. He says, against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty. Anybody born guilty? Anybody knew how to tell a lie? Nobody had to train you? Anybody born with some proclivities you knew weren't right and mama didn't have to teach it to you, daddy didn't have to teach it to you, it just come up in you, didn't it? And there was always a switch in the corner waiting on you because they knew you were going to do something wrong. Nobody taught you. Just, you just come with Come with the package. And he says, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire God. You desire truth in the inward being. You, God, want me to know myself, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart that heart that cannot be seen or thought about, that spirit that I am, that spirit nature that I am. He says, purge me with hyssop, thinking about mama switch, and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. He says, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. He says, hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquity. Lord, you know my heart, but what I need you to do, he says in verse 10 of Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. In other words, yes, God knows your heart. That's why God wants to change your heart. That's why God wants to fix your heart. That's why God wants to renew your heart because God does not want you to stay as you are just because you came as you were. Lord have mercy. Never be satisfied living in the pit. Even the prodigal son came to his senses and got up out the pit. His father didn't come looking for him. Mother didn't come looking for him. Daddy let him stay right there and do everything he was big and bad enough to do. But when he came to his sense, when he looked back over his life and thought about how good he had it before he left home, he got out of that pit and headed back to the house. Isn't that good news? Yes. That, 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 that when you know and you have that assurance that you're a child of God, God will give you power for living the obedient life, and it's all based on your communication with God. What are you saying to God on a daily basis? 
How are you interacting with God? How is your prayer life? How is your devotion with God? Because your obedience will keep you close to God. Then the third thing, I've got to move on here. The third sign, we have an inner assurance. We have power that the Holy Spirit gives us for a living. But then during this life, you're going to prove what you say. In other words, your faith is going to be proven before you leave here. What you, what you really believe is going to be demonstrated by the way you live. Time and time again, life challenges, life tests, life buffets, but Christ always redeems the righteous. In other words, believers go from one good degree of grace to another. Every day, in every way, their faith is affirmed by the testimony they give. Obedience to the word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit results in a changed life that speaks to your condition in Christ. You ought not be the same you was when you first got saved. Y'all know that hymn, Take Me Back. Take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received you. You're never going back there. Why would you want to go back to your initial conversion when going forward is better? That's, that'd, be like, that'd be like, you know, uh, a drug addict always chasing that first high. Trying to get that first high. They're trying every drug they know. Trying to rediscover that first time they got high. Because nobody has told them you'll never feel like you felt the first time you got high. You already had that experience. The only thing high you're going to get now is higher. And that's the way it is with faith in God. You can't be taken back to the first time you gave your life to Jesus Christ. Your relationship should grow stronger. It should grow higher. It should grow better. It should become more intimate. You should be more mature in God. Your faith is supposed to soar like an eagle. Wow. And the only way that can happen is for your faith to be proven, to be tested. Believers who believe that Christ will return do everything in their power to become more like him. See, we don't change our lives to be saved. We don't gauge our salvation by the condition and position we're living in. We are saved because we believe that Jesus died for our sin. That Jesus died on the cross. That Jesus rose on the third day morning. We are saved because we accept Jesus' uh, crucifixion as the atonement for our sin. It's not based on our emotions. It's not based on our intellect. It's based and rooted and grounded in the word of God. I mean, you know, emotions don't last. You feel good this morning, you're going to feel crazy by nightfall. Mm -hmm. You can't have a lasting marriage based on your emotions. Your emotions are going to be all over the place. Sometimes you're going to feel like hugging him. Sometimes you're going to feel like cutting him. <laughs> See, so your salvation is not dependent on your fickle emotions. Your salvation is dependent on what God said in his word. One time I was feeling not so kind, uh, Sister Ellie, and uh, Miss Griffin said to me, she said, you chose me. <laughs> I couldn't say nothing. Because <laughs> I did. In other words, she was saying, you in it now, brother. Hey, you chose me out of all of them, you might as well keep your choice because I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> You act funny all you want to. I'm going back here in the back room to do some work on the computer. <laughs> let, let me know when you get yourself together. <laughs> what, what, is, what is the thing? God said what? He chose us. Yes. And he says, no devil in hell can by any means snatch us out of his hand. 
So it doesn't matter what changes we go through in life, we are God throughout eternity. Unless you snatch yourself out the household of faith, nobody else can't snatch you out. Nothing you can do to change God's mind because God chose you. From the foundation of the world, before you were conceived, God chose you and loved on you and brought you to this present moment. And God says, when you get to acting funny as a child, he said, well, you mine. I'm going to put up with you as long as I can. I'm going to put up with you. And that's what he does. He looks beyond our faults and see our every need. Isn't that a good God? Amen. Somebody, somebody says that believers wrestle with their own inner demons and then they wrestle with demons in the world until victory is won. Y'all know this hymn number 348, Satisfied with Jesus. It says, I'm satisfied with Jesus. He's done so much for me. He suffered to redeem me. He has died to set me free. I'm satisfied, I'm satisfied, I'm satisfied with Jesus. But the question comes to me, as I think of Calvary, is my master satisfied with me? Now that's deep, 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 deep. Because we can get so satisfied being saved until we never ask God, are you satisfied with me? with my life, with what I'm doing in the world? Are you satisfied, Lord, with the way I have uh, allowed your spirit to use me to be a blessing in the world? And it's not going to come without some pain. Michael Green says, if you want to determine whether or not an air tank of the kind divers need is usable, you test it. Of course, you do not test it when it's empty. <laughs> you test it by subjecting it to pressure. And the pressure used in such a test is far beyond what would be considered normal. Only under intense pressure can hidden flaws be exposed. Under the pressures of prosperity and success, we are tested severely. Praise detects the crack of pride Wealth reveals the flaw of selfishness and learning discovers the leak of unbelief. Did you get all that? Praise, when people praise you, it'll uncover any pride in your life. When you get money in your pocket, we'll see if you're going to be selfish. When you get an education, we're going to discover whether or not you believe what you say you believe. And Paul says it like this, but we have this treasure in clay jars, bodies, human bodies, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. He says we live as human beings under intense scrutiny and intense pressure. Here's, here's, here's how, he, how he says it. He says, we are afflicted in every way. We go through what everybody else goes through twice. He said, but we're not crushed by it. He says, we're perplexed, just like everybody else, we get confused. The only difference is we're not driven to despair. <laughs> he, he, he says, we're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. He says we're struck down, but we're not destroyed. He says, yes, life heaps pressure on us, squeezes us, puts us in situations that are aimed to not only bring out the best in us, but to reveal to us where we're weak and need God. It is to show us that you're not all that in a bowl of chips. If it had not been the Lord's Spirit on the inside of you, you would have fallen and you would have been destroyed just like everybody else. And so when you look back over your life and see what the Lord has done, praise is in order. Praise is in order to God who kept you from danger seen and unseen. 
praises go to God who said, listen, I've got your back. I am your shield and your buckler. I am your God. I am with you. Amen. When you got a piercing, powerful, yes. proven faith, yes. when it's your time to answer, you'll be able to look at the Lord and say, here am I. Send me. Here am I. I've got the full assurance of faith that I'm a child of God. And then when the devil tries to tempt you with the wealth and the fame of the world, you'll be able to tell him this joy I have. The world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Devil, you can't pay for it. It is not for sale. What God has done in my life is more valuable than anything this world has to offer. And I've been tried in the fire. I've been proven. I know without shadow of a doubt that I'm born again. That's the assurance we need. And that's the assurance we're going to need in these coming days. And once you know without doubt that you're born again, it doesn't matter if the earth quakes. Doesn't matter if the flood waters rage, you'll be able to say one thing about it. I'm going to live forever in the kingdom of my Lord. I'm going to hear him say, Welcome. I'm going to hear him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to hear him say, Come on up a little higher. I'm going to hear him say, This is your kingdom. Walk on in it. Man, that's going to be a great day because you stood the test. You knew you were somebody in Jesus. Appreciate your salvation today. As we take communion, as we refresh our spirits this morning, it is to empower us for living, empower us against all the vicissitudes of life, cause us to be able to bear up under sometimes a heavy burden, but not be destroyed. Man, God gives us stuff that toughens us causes us to walk when we really want to fall down. He gives us stuff that keeps on going. Isn't that good news? Yes, it is. Thank you. There's no temptation taken you but that which is subject to everybody. God will not put more on you than you can bear. So don't you do it to yourself. Live a life that God will be pleased with. Be true to God, be true to yourself, and be true to your calling. Everything else will take care of itself. Amen? Amen. Let's stand this morning. Thank you for allowing me to share the word of God with you. The doors of the church are open at this time for anyone who does not have a church home or does not know Jesus Christ as, as Lord and Savior. He gave his life for you so that you could have a right to the tree of life so that you can live a life free from guilt, shame, and condemnation. Thank you. He came so that you could soar. You could overcome any obstacle that tried to hold you back. Your faith in God will get you there. It'll get you there. We're singing this morning, Just As I Am, hymn number 145. Just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me. Just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me. Thou didst me come to 
in the presence of our God as we prepare now for the Lord's Supper. The ritual of Holy Communion is printed in your bulletin. We ask that you would follow with us this morning. Hallelujah. 